thanks for the opportunity and uh, <clears throat> the kind introduction. I was hoping she was going to mention that I did win the Economist of the Year Award, or did you? <laughs> I, I'm not trying to sound blasé, I just want you to have faith in my forecast. <laughs> I have my usual uni uniform on. I think Loki knows it by this time. It's my uh, 95 World Cup tie. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it, it got presented to me by uh, Louis Leit's son. Who remembers Louis Leit? His, his son was in my class at, at UJ when it was still Rao many years ago. He was a bright kid um, and never attended lectures because he was a typical entrepreneur, you know, looking after some of the family businesses and Alice Park and stuff like that. But every time before a test, he came to see me quickly for a, a crash course. And, uh, and he passed uh, comfortably 65, I think. Um, and that had nothing to do with the fact that I had a VIP ticket to the President's Lounge at Ellis Park. <laughs> Obviously. I think the only two things more difficult to do than talk about economics on such a beautiful summer's day. Uh, and those two things are trying to climb a cliff that is leaning towards you or trying to kiss a lady that is leaning away from you. <laughs> Although the Spanish football president <clears throat> didn't uh, have too much trouble. <clears throat> Strange world we live in. Um, I'm going to not necessarily go into onto a micro level in terms of waste. The one thing that I think we could do without, uh, which is very wasteful, is the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank. <laughs> I would love to put all five of those individuals onto a rubbish hump. <clears throat> and I'll motivate that as I go along. There's nothing wrong with the Reserve Bank, by the way. It's a fantastic institution. They don't have to change the mandate. They must just change the composition of the Monetary Policy Committee. But I'll get to, uh, to that in a minute. This, uh, how do you like my opening slide? Not bad. That is the future of energy. There's enough energy in 90 minutes of sunshine that falls on planet Earth to run the whole world's energy requirements from oil, coal and gas for a year. So if you want to get rid of waste big time, CO2 for instance, if you want to protect the ozone layer, then you need to get into this stuff as quickly as possible. And here's a silver lining to the load shedding. I mean, load shedding is terrible, am I right? I just want to mention that the Afrikaans word Beertkrach is actually more descriptive. Because in English, load shedding could mean many things, am I right? It could be shedding your hair, weight, right? But in Afrikaans, Beertkrach, if the power goes off, it is your beard. It's your turn. Sometimes Afrikaans is more descriptive. But we've been thrust, we've been forced to move into fast forward mode, this country, with regard to solar power. Am I right? Whether we like it or not. And um, so if one really looks around you, you will find silver linings all over the show. And uh, before I forget, Loki, if, you, um, if you're interested in receiving the bright side, I write this publication every month for an international uh, for forex uh, company, Currencies Direct, and it's, it's it says in the, in the intro, it says, this is a monthly wrap of the good news in the economy in South Africa, and it's designed to make cynical persons cry, <laughs> to make them very unhappy. And it's amazing how easy it is to write this publication once a month. Just a couple of short snippets. It also has a, um, on the last page, it's got a monthly calculation of the real effective exchange rate of the rand, it tells you what the rand should be trading against the dollar, etc. So it, it could be useful from various perspectives and by the way, it's free. Uh, so if you want to receive it and send it to your clients and so on and uh, provide them with some hope on a regular basis. So moving on, who of you owns property by a show of hands? Who has a mortgage bond? Okay, so uh, you'll like my views on the Reserve Bank shortly <laughs> when we get there. Just a quick uh, property and construction snapshot. The FNB property barometer came out, was published yesterday. Uh, it just uh, it shows the continuing decline in property prices. The AFIMAT construction index, which I compiled for this listed company, had this magnificent recovery after COVID. You will notice the COVID V on, on several of my slides. There you can see that crash in the, in the second quarter of 2020. Remember that one? April 2020, that was a horrible quarter. Um, I was almost arrested for <laughs> jogging on my lawn. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, and we were, we were in the hands of the command council. It's a very scary thought if you think back of it. Somebody told me at the time, he told me, you know, Rolf, those command council members, they are so narrow-minded. 
When they look through a keyhole, they use both eyes. <laughs> but that's behind us now, fortunately. And then we had a magnificent recovery. What, my, my problem with the Afrimat Construction Index is that this thing should not be going sideways. It should be going north. You, you, you only have to travel in, in any one direction in South Africa for a while to notice the dire need for decent accommodation housing, especially for poorer people. And were we able as a country to do something about this in the past? Who remembers the RDP housing project? We built 3 million houses in 10 years. And we created 10 million jobs in the process. But then came Mr. Zuma. And uh, Ali, they call him Alibaba and the 40 thieves. <laughs> I think they were about 140, but anyway. And, and then things changed dramatically because all sensible economic policies just disappeared off the table. And so for a decade we had state capture. And if you think, if you don't believe me, then, then, then please have a look at the Zondo Commission report. If, if I happen to offend anybody here today, I sincerely apologize for speaking the truth. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that we had, <laughs> we had uh, a decade where our state-owned enterprises were, um, were, were just, uh, you know, they became more or less useless. Uh, I don't have to mind you about the state of our roads, uh, our railways, our harbors, etc. But we are moving in the right direction. We are curing that problem. Uh, just, uh, I'll get back to it in a second. Just to complete the property issue, if you look at the total bond applications submitted from first-time buyers and repeat buyers uh, administered by Better Bond, once again, a, a nice COVID V recovery from COVID. The dilemma is right now, for first-time buyers, we are back where we were before COVID. And that's a huge problem, and it's entirely as a result of ridiculously high interest rates. It is unbelievable that a developing country with such unemployment as we have has the highest real interest rate in the world. So what is the real interest rate? What's the prime rate right now? 11.75, am I right? So you deduct from that the inflation rate, which is 4.8, came out a couple of hours ago, and that gives you the highest real interest rate in the world by a long shot. This is crazy. I don't know how these five individuals that comprise the Monetary Policy Committee, four of them were appointed by Zuma, by the way. I don't know how they sleep at night, really. They don't understand economics, that I can promise you. Not one of them will pass my economics one test. And I've had discussions with three of those five members, and they are, uh, I must watch my language now. And Afrikaans sounds also so dom so spoken, but anyway. Unfortunately, they do exist. So uh, you can clearly see the downward trend after interest rates started going up. It was not necessary to raise interest rates in this country because we have never had demand inflation, not in the past 15 years. The only time higher interest rates can combat inflation is if people buy too much. Are you buying too much? I don't think so. You go into any shop in South Africa and the shelves are full. You go to any motor dealer and you can buy a car. There's no demand inflation. I'll tell you in a minute what caused inflation. Uh, I think you'll understand it. The MPC doesn't. The average uh, value of building plans passed and buildings completed. A very attractive COVID V over there. And then once again, flat line. Then it took a dip because of the interest rates. And fortunately, there has been a slight uptick in the last quarter. Hardware retail sales, that's a, that's a, a, a silver lining in the construction trade. They, you can see the COVID V and then it went right up to near record levels and it stayed there ever since. This is us, you know, painting the garage door and fixing the roof, trying to keep our marriages intact. If you know what I mean. Um, value of construction works, once again, a COVID V and then a recovery, and then uh, you know, well, at least it's moving in the right direction. But this, should be, this baby should be way above pre-COVID levels. And the only reason why this is still down is because of the incompetence within the public sector, especially the state-owned enterprises. But that is being addressed. That is being addressed. Construction sector employment, this is one of my favorite slides. In the second quarter of this year, the construction sector, for the first time ever, created more jobs than any other sector. 100,000 in one quarter. 
most of them in the formal sector. This is really great news. This has a lot to do with renewable energy because you can't just put a, you know, a, a solar panel on the floor and expect it to do something. There, there is, especially with the large businesses, there is a lot of construction activity associated with the switch to renewable energy, which is good. Our largest real estate investment trust, Redefine, their uh, occupancy rates have more or less fully recovered except for offices. And that is a direct result of COVID. What we've got now is Teams and Zoom. I think we use it. Who we use, uses Teams and Zoom on a daily basis? I, I, just about all of us. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fantastic medium to communicate. I just don't know, um, you know working, working at home, I don't know how you apply that concept to, to the bottom of home affairs. It, 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 I, I still have to wrap my, my mind about that. You know why they changed the streets in Pretoria into one-way streets many years ago? It, it was to prevent the civil servants that arrive late from obstructing those that want to go home early. <laughs> and, and it greatly improved the traffic flow. So this is an intriguing slide. If you wondered what your house is worth, uh, the red line is what it will cost you to build a house. That's, that's sort of the analogy. And the blue line is uh, what you can get for your house. So um, right now it's a buyer's market. Right now it's going to cost you a lot more to, buy, to build a house than to, than, uh, than to uh, you know, buy, buy another property. So it's a buyer's market. The good news is that those two lines always merge. Always. It may take a couple of quarters, might even take a couple of years. Uh, and once they've merged and the blue line is above, then, it's, then it changes into a seller's market again. But we certainly need lower interest rates to help this crucially important sector. For this slide, I've chosen a theme from one of our neighboring states. That's the Zimbabwean economy. <laughs> and this is the Venezuelan economy. Now, those two countries, Zimbabwe and Venezuela, have become failed states. I was, uh, one of the asset tests for a failed state is if a large section of the population decides to leave that country. Um, how many Cubans have left America, have left Cuba to go to America, Miami, in the last 20 years? It's a, it's a couple of million. How many Americans have tried the return trip? <laughs> the answer is zero. Uh, Venezuela, in the space of about 18 months, 3 million people left. In Zimbabwe's case, over a period of several years, 5 million people left. The ones with degrees went to London, and the ones without degrees came to South Africa. <laughs> as you probably know, um, which is not a serious problem as long as we can create jobs for everybody, I suppose. Why did these countries become failed states? Is it because they don't have resources? Cheapest diesel in the world you'll find in Venezuela. But the pumps don't work <laughs> because they've scared away the private sector. When a political elite, with the assistance sometimes of the military, and a couple of bumbling bureaucrats take over a propulsive industry in a country, that country is gone. Its economy is gone. I mean, it is so predictable. Have you seen that night picture of North and South Korea? The one is, looks like a Christmas tree, right? That, the other one is dark. It's dark in so many respects. The difference between East and West Germany uh, in the old days, there are so many examples of what happens to an economy when nationalization occurs. That is the prelude to communism. It's another word for stealing, as you probably know. And that, that is what went wrong here. Economic policy can make or break a country. Now, to recover from nationalization can take anything between half a century and a century. To recover from state capture, can take five to 10 years. And if you have two years of COVID thrust upon you, it may take a little bit longer, but I still think, I'm still counting on two to three years from now, we would have fully recovered from state capture because we have a democratic constitution which guarantees free enterprise principles. And nothing is going to change that as far as I'm concerned. Spe specifically not under the current regime. Mr. Ramaphosa knows exactly what he's doing, despite a hell of a lot of pressure and opposition from within his own party. When he was elected at the end of 2017, he had 53% support in the National Executive Council of the ANC. 
that support has gone to 78%. And the reason why he's moving slowly to get rid of the dead wood, proverbially speaking, is because if he had moved too fast, then there was always the danger of the red faction in the ANC, the radical economic transformation faction. They don't know what it means, but it's there. Amalgamating or uh, forming a coalition with some radical political groups, and then uh, they may have taken over the government. And then we would not be here today. And you would not have opened that new plant, Loki. I'm serious. You wouldn't. But our constitution keeps us intact. And we are undoing the harm, slowly but surely, of state capture. We have just handed over the keys to South Africa's biggest export port in Durban. 46% of all our exports goes out of that port. We've handed it over to a private sector company from the Philippines with a track record, proven international track record, spanning decades of how to manage, expand, and run a harbor. I mean, this is privatization. I haven't seen any Cusato strikes about that. So maybe they've lost their teeth, which is good. So whatever they call it, collaboration, public-private partnerships, this is good. This was promised to us in, December, in, in February 2022, 20, last year, not this year, last year, SONA, President Ramaphosa said the only way that this economy will get up to its former glory in terms of sustained high growth is if the private sector becomes heavily involved. And there were eyebrows that were lifted within his own party about this, but this, what is this? This is, not, this is not radical economic transformation, is this? Well, radical economic transformation is dead and buried. We are moving in the right direction as far as economic policy is concerned. And I cannot overemphasize how important this is. Because not only did we not have nationalization, and we won't have it, we did have state capture, and that cost us something, I'll show you in a second. But it's not so bad, and we can fix it. And we are slowly but surely fixing it. We've just seen it now with the Olifants water project in Limpopo. For 20 years, the public sector tried to make sure there's water for the people in the most densely populated parts of that province. No success. No surprises. Now, 17 listed companies in the stock exchange in the resources sector have come to the party, 50-50 joint venture, but now they are calling the shots, and now they will have water within a couple of months from now. 600 kilometers of water pipelines are being built. And the same thing with the land port upgrades, which were, was announced a couple of days ago. Public-private partnership. This is unbelievably good news. That is one of the most beautiful words in the English language, privatization. It is the antithesis of communism. And it makes me feel positive about the future. OK, so BRICS has expanded, right? OK, which of these countries do you like? Well, I can tell you which I don't like. I don't like China, but that's one of those things. I certainly don't like Iran. I'm not crazy about Saudi Arabia. I mean, until recently, women were not allowed to drive there. Whether they could drive or not is another question. <laughs> of course they can drive. Since allowing them to drive, the accident rate has declined dramatically in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> uh, OK, so this happened. Now, I was on the radio yesterday uh, commenting on the prospects for improved agricultural exports to Saudi Arabia, where we are already exporting a lot of uh, meat products there. And if we can go down that value chain, um, maybe there are some opportunities for us. But this is essentially just a talk shop anyway. It's an anti-America club, uh, but makes life interesting. What is more important, and this is hot off the press, is that the G20 countries, have you heard of the G20 countries? The G20 countries, G20 is dead and buried. It's now G21. They've allowed the African Union in as a member. The European Union is there already. And the membership has doubled. <laughs> So there were 46 members, including all the EU members. Now with 55 from Africa, it's, it's uh, 101. Fortunately, not Nelson, 111. That's a bad score for cr a cricketer, if you're a batsman. But this is quite exciting. And you may ask yourselves, but why has the African Union been invited to be part of the G20, most influential countries in the world, when you've got uh, coup d'etats, the, the Africa's 100th coup d'etat, happened a couple of months ago. Uh, there's a lot of instability on the continent, as you know, etc. It's because of renewable energy. It's because of renewable energy, because Africa's uh, resource, share of the resources required 
to make the shift to green energy is astounding. And three countries already in Africa have uh, prohibited the export of certain materials that are used uh, in that. And, and the rest of the world wants to make sure that they have supplies. But this time round, if the African Union is now a member, they could use that lobbying power to make sure that this stuff gets, the value gets added here. Right now we export aluminium ore to Southeast Asia and we import the pots and pans back after they've added a thousand percent each point of value added. Not very bright, by the way. So hopefully this time round we'll get our act together and make sure that the jobs are created here. And, and this, is, this is a huge, huge new growth industry for, for the future. So what did state capture cost us? If you look at the blue line, that is simply South Africa's GDP in real terms. You can read it off the vertical axis, 2022 last year, 6.6 .6 trillion rand. That's the value of all the plastic containers, the food, the, the, the uh, Mercedes Benzes, the Nissans, the Toyotas, Rangers, all of these uh, vehicles that we produce in South Africa and we export them to 150 countries, uh, etc. Everything that we produce, including services, of course, was worth 6.6 .6 trillion. And there you can see a slight COVID dip, of course. The red line is what our GDP would have been if we had grown at the average growth rate of the, our peers in the emerging market group, which we happened to do before state capture. So Mr. Zuma and his cronies, who are all listed in the Zono Commission report, by the way, they cost us almost 3 trillion rand in lost GDP. But this can be fixed. This can be fixed. Think about the maths. Once you're down there and you do the right things, you can get back up there, you know, pronto, especially if interest rates start declining. And especially if they do things like resuscitating the RDP housing project and work with the private sector to get things going in South Africa. And there are signs that is, that is already happening. But that lies behind us now, fortunately. The geopolitical risk index in the world was until very recently last year at one of its highest levels in, in three decades. And then it came crashing down as if the, the world has just sort of appreciated the fact that uh, there will be lingering hostility in Ukraine and Russia. Sometimes the Russians will gain ground and then they will be forced back again. And at some point in time, they will probably uh, make peace, which is nice to know. But if you look at a map of the world, the war in Eastern Europe, China threatening to invade uh, Taiwan, uh, other shenanigans in the Middle East and in, in uh, West Africa, you look at South Africa, it is actually quite a safe place. <laughs> we are very far removed from North Korean nuclear missiles <laughs> that are being fired into the ocean. Not very good for the fish, although only 20% of them explode. Uh, <laughs> these slides, of course, are one-dimensional, but it does remind me of my favorite joke. Uh, I think some of you especially that gentleman over there must have heard this uh, a dozen times. But the statistician will tell you if your feet are in the oven and your head is in the freezer, on average you are quite comfortable. <laughs> Please don't try that. Okay, I just want to quickly say something about the Monetary Policy Committee and then I'll move on to uh, pretty soon to really good news. So this is South Africa's household credit extension. This is not technical. Uh, you can once again read it off the vertical axis where we are now, July 2023. Uh, just uh, for interest's sake, two of my previous jobs were financial editor of a daily newspaper. And I was also a management accountant at a bakery group. And I learned two important lessons in those jobs. People do not like stale news. And they don't like stale bread. <laughs> and I'm giving you fresh, the freshest data that I can find. So if you read on the vertical axis, it's just below 2.09 trillion rand. So your mortgage bond, your credit card, your credit card balance, all of that is included in that 2.09 trillion rand. It's total household credit in South Africa. That's outstanding. Now, what's the interesting thing here? The interesting thing is here is that um, the COVID dip is almost non-existent. But in real terms, if you adjust this figure for inflation, it's lower than it was 10 years ago. And, and this, this is what gripes me about the MPC. They simply do not have the background, not theoretically and not in terms of experience, to be conducting the type of policies they're doing right now. This economy has never been able to grow on a, for a sustained period of time at high rates unless household credit is also growing in real terms. Never. 
They should know that. It's as if they do not want this economy to grow. We all have frustrations in our jobs, am I right? And sometimes at home. The neighbor's dog is barking, but there is, there, there is nothing that grates me so much as this, this ineffective, simply wrong policy of the Monetary Policy Committee. So what have I done about this? I've done a lot about this. I've published in the Business Day, I've published in every conceivable publication, South Africa, Engineering News, uh, Business Maverick, um, and I've also had our discussions with more than one cabinet minister. And, they've, and he asked me, but what can we do? Should we change the mandate? No, you don't have to change the mandate. The Reserve Bank's mandate, like any other central bank's mandate, says the central bank must try to prevent high inflation, right? We know that. But also, in the same sentence, it says, but ensure that, that you also keep an eye on growth and job creation. Can I sell that to you? The problem with our MPC is that they, they have tunnel vision. They only see the one side. And I told him, all you need to do, you don't have to change the mandate. That will be bad publicity for us. But if you expand the composition of the MPC, there won't be any bad publicity. There will be good publicity because what they could do is three people from the Reserve Bank, that, that would, you, you'd need to do that, maybe just replace some people, but anyway. Uh, and then you have the DG of National Treasury and the Chief Economist, and I can guarantee you they don't agree with the Reserve Bank, they agree with me. And the DG of, of Trade and Industry, the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition, and the Chief Economist. And then you have three private sector economists on, on the committee, uh, with at least 25 years experience and a master's or a doctorate in economics. So now you have 10 members. If that had been the case, our prime rate would not be 11.75, it would be closer to 10 or 9.5. And if I had been the governor, and I had a good chance in the old days, <laughs> I'm serious, <laughs> I would never have raised the interest rates. It would still be 7%, the prime rate would still be 7%, because there was no need to change the interest rates. And I'll maybe just uh, explain that in a second. But we are paying the, the price. Household debt costs have increased. Our leading business cycle indicator has taken a dip. But now let's go to the good news. The good news is that the reason for higher inflation, I don't have to tell you that the whole world has been battling with inflation. I think you know this. When I saw two years ago that Germany has higher inflation than South Africa for the first time, I think, ever, I realized something terrible is wrong. And I did my homework, and I realized that this, this baby, is the reason, this is the main reason. And it's all related to COVID and lockdowns and, and the supply side constraints which you know all about. Your global container freight rate charges went up by 700%. 700% over a period of two years. And now it's come crashing down, so it was very predictable that inflation would come down eventually. Now a country like the US, you may ask me, but Dr. Puerto, uh, uh, was it okay for the U.S. to increase interest rates? Yes, it was entirely okay because they paid so many millions of Americans, tens of millions, so much money, 20,000 bucks a month, <laughs> that, you know, they were just spending money left, right, and center. The United States has now flown past Germany and the U.K. as our biggest source of foreign tourists <laughs> this year. They've got so much money, they don't know what to do with it. So they buy stuff, left, right, and center. They have an element of demand inflation. And the interest rate went from 0.25%, right, 0.25. So you've got your pension in a money market account. When can you retire? When you're 900 years old. I mean, 0.25% is not a return. It went from 0.25 to 4.75%. That is a sort of, you know, an interesting return. Nothing like uh, dividend yields on on our stock exchange, or our own money market rates, um, etc. Et so America was justified to raise the interest rates. They have full employment. They have de facto full employment in America. But we don't have full employment. So it was the wrong policy choice. Median global inflation is dropping, which is great news. It's dropping further. And I'll get back to the interest rate. That's, that's uh, uh, the really good news, uh, not the interest rate, the inflation rate. By the way, the CPI was published. Uh, earlier today, and it came, it came in at 4.8%, 4.7% in July. So that's fine, that's fine, that's nothing serious. Um, the important thing is that food prices have dropped. Food prices 
have come down from about 10% to 8% and, and the trajectory is certainly downward. Okay, so as an economist, I have to touch on the, on the exchange rate very briefly, hopefully just very briefly. Um, just remember that a currency cannot be weak on its own. It can only be weak relative to another currency. So what you have here is the real effect of exchange rate of the rand. What is this? This is the trade weighted average if exchange rate of the rand against our 15 major trading partners' currencies. And you freeze out the effect of inflation because if your, inf if your currency does not depreciate by your um, inflation differential but w w that you have with you, yourself and your trading partners, then you will reach a stage where you can never export anything because your prices are just going up too fast. So, and the rand, interestingly enough, at the end of August, was, was valued in terms of its real effective exchange rate exactly the, at the same level as, it, as its long-term average. That's an average that comes uh, over a period of almost uh, half a century. So the rand is not that undervalued. It is undervalued against the dollar, but everybody is. And interestingly enough, between 1 June and 31 August, for th during those three months, the rand was the strongest performing currency in the world against the US dollar. Uh, I must be quite honest now that there was a little bit of a base effect involved here because of that ship that came in to Simonstown to pick up Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so there was a bit of a base effect, but it's nice to know that our currency is not as weak as some of these cynical economists make them out to be. Uh, I bumped into Mr. Irvin Jim the other day at the ETV studios and we had a chat about this and that and I asked Irvin, He's a trade union leader, whether he knew the definition of a communist, which he didn't, amongst other things. Uh, so I told him, I told him, even a communist is somebody who's got nothing, but he wants to share it with you. <laughs> and he didn't find it funny. An economist, on the other hand, is somebody that will marry Charlize Tron for her money, <laughs> which is not a bad idea. I get asked by my students sometimes, why does the RAND always recover? And then I just flashed the slide. It is one of the 20 most traded currencies in the world. It is, as far as I'm concerned, destined to become, uh, with a bit of luck, ultimately the common currency for the whole of Africa, or at least sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, don't, don't lose faith in the RAND. It's here to stay. The IMF expects eight of the ten largest economies in the world to grow this year, which is great news. There's no global recession in sight. Um, the EPSA, our purchasing managers index, PMI, this is hot off the press, has returned to more or less the 50 new, neutral level. That's really good news. Uh, we've seen a slight downward trend because of the interest rates, but as long as we are very close to that 50 level, it means that our manufacturing sector is still performing. And the JSE recently reached an all-time record high. It has taken a dip since. Um, it's been said that uh, the way to make a, a small fortune on the stock exchange is to start with a big one. But that's cynical, and I don't agree with that. If you bought shares, for instance, in Sasol or more or less any other company in March 2020, uh, you would be smiling today. The secret to the JSE is stay there. If you're an investment manager and you get your statement in every month or every quarter and, and you see, oh, it's worth less than last, last quarter, don't panic, just relax. It will, it will get back up. In the meantime, you're getting dividends. Some of our resource stocks are paying dividends of between 5 and 15%. That's really not a bad investment. Capital formation, there's a very pronounced COVID V and it's on a, a growth track, which is great news. And the public sector, this is really good news, the, the blue, blue bars, the public sector is finally also coming to the party. If this trend continues, then my prediction that we will get to 4% growth in 2025 will hold true. It's about time I won that competition again. <laughs> uh, and other good news is that the GDP last year, new record high. By the way, you won't see, uh, read this in social media, am I right? You will also won't read it in... Uh, uh, these little uh, comical newspapers of Iqbal survey, uh, the disaster and the Cape crimes, uh, and, and then the China Daily, that was the old Pretoria news, but it doesn't exist anymore. Um, he gave instruction to his editors to write something demeaning about Mr. Ramaphosa and his inner circle, 
every day, and they're succeeding in that. Because Iqbal Survey and his editors are firmly in the claws of the red group. They want to continue with state capture, uh, but they're running out of money. And my plea has been to companies all over this country, please do not advertise in those newspapers, because it's like the new age, which is still alive. Uh, you remember the new age, don't you? The Gupta's publication. Um, if you look at our manufacturing sector, this is almost incredible. A new, uh, uh, from about, despite the higher interest rates, from about the middle of last year, new record average monthly manufacturing sales in real terms. It is all, uh, and exports have got a lot to do with that. It is as if we've picked up some business during COVID. And after COVID, immediately after COVID, when some, many harbors were still closed, you couldn't get product, you could get product from South Africa. And as if some importers, retailers, wholesalers in the rest of the world realized that well, you can buy stuff in South Africa, like plastic containers. A word from our sponsor. <laughs> Excellent quality, good price. Uh, and, and we picked up business, which is, you know, once again, there's a silver lining in, in the COVID fallout. And if you ever want to diversify, and I'm serious, then wholesale should be right on top of your list. I mean, this is a, a stupendous sector. If you look at the sales value, it is approaching, on a quarterly basis, one trillion rand. One trillion rand of sales, almost, in a quarter. It is a, a, an enormous uh, sector. If you drive between our Tambo and Pretoria, as I do re regularly, uh, you'll notice what I'm talking about. That R21 is, uh, well, they're considering renaming it uh, uh, Doc Botas Autobahn. <laughs> it's my only bad habit, by the way. Um, the recovery rate for overseas tourists, magnificent, heading towards 90%. Once again, you won't read that in any, uh, any other publication except uh, The Bright Side, <laughs> uh, which I write. Annualized GDP, hot off the press. A couple of weeks ago, the figures got published. We are growing our economy. We can grow it at a much faster rate. All of us in this room intuitively know that this economy can grow at higher rates. But we need the right policies. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that we are moving in the direction of the right policies. Uh, fast and furious, as long as they change the composition of the MPC. So this is the really good news I've got for you. And that is that the producer price index, that's the blue line, which apparently the MPC doesn't watch. Because, and it, it surprises me, because that is a, a leading indicator for the CPI, the consumer price index, which we understand as the inflation rate. Now, that, those are quarterly figures, but I just want to tell you something. In July last year, the producer price index annualized increase was 18%. 18% year-on-year increase the cost of manufacturing stuff in this country. By the way, that was similar to most other countries in the world. Look what's happened to it since. It's now below 3%. And that told you that CPI was going to drop. And it did, predictably. But the government of the Reserve Bank still tells us that inflation hasn't peaked. Now, is there anybody here that... <laughs> I mean, really, I should send this graph to him. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to remember, but I don't think he answers my emails anymore. In any event, other good news, total exports shattered every single year. The same thing will happen this year. And one of the reasons, one of the important reasons why we have lower inflation than the rest of the world is because of our farmers. Uh, we are the most food secure country on the whole of the African continent. We are a huge net exporter of food. And that's one of the reasons why our inflation rate is relatively low. You don't have to wait for weeks on end before foodstuffs come you know, by ship from wherever in the world. It's right around, this net not it? Checkers, checkers. No. <laughs> I'm not punting them, you know. I've told my wife that uh, I refuse to retire at a place if there's not a Woolies Foods within five kilometers. And my second last slide, disposable, third last. Disposable income of households. So uh, things are really bad in South Africa, aren't they? Your total disposable income of households, the Reserve Bank data, in the first quarter of this year, it's an all-time record high. Things are not as bad as some people try to make them out, uh, especially people that want you to take your assets offshore, which, which is not a very good idea, by the way. And this is uh, arguably one of my cherries on top of the cake, and that is that this is the most important growth driver that we've got right now, is record imports of machinery and equipment. 
um, it's, it's doubled uh, in the last two and a half years. These are uh, figures for the first six months of the year. This is unbelievable good news. It's our single most important import uh, group, machinery and equipment. I don't have to tell you a lot of that stuff, solar panels and lithium batteries and what have you, but the fact of the matter is that is part and parcel of broader capital formation that is taking place in the economy, of which impact obviously is also part with this new warehouse, which is, I'd like to visit that place. Uh, I'm always inquisitive. This is really good news, and this is not going to stop. This is going to remain a growth driver for at least a decade, if not longer. And then my last slide, my all-time favorite slide, we created 1.4 million new jobs last year. Another 400,000 this year, from January to June. 400, more than 400,000 jobs. 90% in the formal sectors. Despite higher interest rates. Despite the slow reforms towards privatization, but it is happening. So just imagine what could happen if they, you know, give some mandrakes to privatization <laughs> or Red Bull, what, whatever you want to use. Uh, and we really get cracking, especially after next year's elections. So things will, you know, stay more or less at a 1%, 2%, maybe if you're a lucky growth rate, until after the elections. And then I think you'll have a big cleanup process happening. And on the route there, for the first time in, in 20 years, I've been able to drive in Taba Zimbi on a, on a tarred road. <laughs> so you can see a lot of road fixing, uh, right? That's, that always happens before an election. It happens in other countries as well, by the way, uh, which is good. It's good for capital formation. So my important message today here is inflation will still come down. The chances of interest rate declines are becoming stronger every day, which is good news for all of us. And as far as economic policy is concerned, just be a little bit patient and trust Mr. Ramaphosa and the mini cabinet that he's built within the presidency. They are trying their level best to try to get rid of unnecessary red tape that stands in the way of impact, that stands in the way of every single company out there in South Africa. So let's hold thumbs that I'm correct, I'm, I'm convinced I am, I've got a, a lot of facts to back me up. It's been said that a pure optimist believes we live in the best of all possible worlds, and a pure pessimist fears this is true. <laughs> but I'm really uh, full of hope for the future, and I'm staying right here. I mean, there are so many opportunities flowing from these challenges, and there's so much to fix. I don't know, understand how an engineer would want to leave South Africa, because there's so much to do. <laughs> for that profession. Thank you very much.